Wow. I'm not having that Coke ever again. Uh, and I'm not kidding. Uh, our next session is the colonization imperative, uh, establishment of the infant microbiome and impacts on health, which will be presented by Dr. David Brumbaugh. Dr. Brumbaugh is assistant professor of pediatrics, gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition at the University of Colorado and associate chief medical officer at the Children's Hospital of Colorado. His professional passion is to care for children with gastrointestinal concerns and engage families in establishing goals of care, keeping the child at the heart of every decision. Please welcome Dr. David Brumbaugh. Thanks very much. Thank you and good morning. I have no uh, disclosures. When we talk about the intestinal microbiome, technically this really refers to the entirety of microorganisms within the GI tract. But for today's session, we're going to be specifically describing the bacteria in our gut. These are our most ancient neighbors that have evolved with us for millennia from our primate ancestors, and yet we still know relatively little about them. Over the last 10 years, we've become better at identifying who they are. We still don't understand how these species talk to each other inside the intestine and what exactly their function is. But with that caveat, my goal this morning is to convince you that from the perspective of our patients, bacteria are their friends. And it's our responsibility as pediatricians to nurture their growth and development within the GI tract and that the decisions we make every day in our offices can impact their health. Our objectives this morning are to discuss the formative steps in development of the human gut microbiome, to describe the most important disruptors to establishment of the gut microbiome, and understand the relevance of those disruptions to health. It all starts with vaginal delivery. As the infant moves from a sterile environment to massive exposure to bacteria during the birth process itself. This is a vertical transmission or inheritance of both vaginal and intestinal bacterial communities from mother to infant, representing the first extra uterine gift from mother to child. However, we know that compared to adults, the newborn microbiota is less diverse and less stable and therefore perhaps more vulnerable to disruption Thereafter, the gut microbiome evolves and matures over time. And this is similar and conserved across the human species, no matter where you live or what diet you are eating. This is a seminal study on the development of the microbiome published in 2012 that looked at gut microbial communities from zero to 18 years of life in three widely different populations from Malawi, rural Venezuela, and the United States. And they looked at gut microbial communities and used a statistic called the Unifrac statistic. This actually is a measure of dissimilarity of the entire micro microbiome to that of an adult counterpart in that community. And as you can see, from zero to two, no matter where you're from, your microbiome is actually quite a bit different than, than that of the adult. But over time, the gut microbiome gradually becomes more adult-like. And so independent of diet, independent of where you are in the world, the microbiome reaches an adult-like stability by age two or three years. What are the most important disruptors to the establishment of the microbiome? Here are my top four. First is maternal antibiotic exposure during pregnancy, typically for the indication of urinary tract infection. This alters and disrupts the diversity of microbial species that infants are exposed to at the time of delivery and thereafter. Cesarean section is a major disruptor to microbiome establishment that I'll discuss more. Formula lacks many of the important bioactive compounds important to microbiome establishment. Human milk has its own microbiome. Lactobacilli and bifidobacteria are transmitted in milk, as are human milk oligosaccharides, which are not digested by the human intestinal tract, but are solely there to nurture the growth of the bifidobacteria in the colon. 
And finally, early life antibiotic exposure has major potential for disruption to establishment of the microbiome. Let's discuss C-sections. So currently about a third of all deliveries in the United States are by cesarean section, and we're the fifth most populous nation in the world. This is a 60% increase in the rate of C-section from the year 2000. What about around the world? So in China and Brazil, which are the first and third most populous nations on this earth, the rate of C-section is 46%. It's almost the normative standard for delivery in these countries. So cesarean delivery represents a profound disruption of the normal physiologic transmission of bacteria to mother to infant. We know that these babies born by cesarean delivery have a gut microbiome that resembles more skin communities of bacteria than those vaginal and intestinal communities they should be inheriting. Our group and others have shown that there is a persistent deficit in colonization with the, ba the Bacteroides phyla. This is a dominant commensal gut bacterial group that populates the adult GI tract. And it just does not take up establishment in infants born by C-section at least through 12 months of life. Sir Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin in 1928, and antibiotics have been an important mainstay of our protection of children since then. But we have to recognize that the landscape of disease has changed. We now are able to vaccinate children against many of the bacteria that cause serious bacterial infections, and this needs to lead to a, re a reconsideration of how we use antibiotics, especially to children early in life. This is a study looking at the Harvard uh, Pilgrim experience with antibiotic prescriptions in the state of Massachusetts from the year 2000 through 2009. The topmost curve represents antibiotic prescriptions to our three to 24 months olds. So you can see that those children are receiving antibiotics at a much higher rate than other children. Gratifyingly, there is a trend towards decreasing oral antibiotic prescribing in our youngest children. However, the average child has been prescribed at least four courses of antibiotics by age six. And what really defies logical explanation is the great amount of variation in prescribing patterns among industrialized nations in the world, between states in the United States, between regions within this state. They don't correspond to any differences in the prevalence of bacterial disease or morbidity outcomes from bacterial disease. And what's the impact of antibiotic exposure on the gut microbiota? This is a study looking at one single patient who was prescribed a seven-day course of oral clindamycin and focusing on the diversity of the Bacteroides phyla within the GI tract. As you can see, starting at the left, pre prior to any exposure to antibiotics, there are many different colors in that vertical column. There is diversity, different species within the Bacteroides phyla within this particular subject's gut. After exposure, a single species of Bacteroides is selected for because it carries an antibiotic resistant gene. And there is no recovery of any diversity for 12 months after that seven day antibiotic course. At 24 months after exposure to antibiotics, there's only partial recovery of diversity of that phyla. And so we can conclude that broad spectrum antibiotics that do impact the anaerobic bacteria in our intestines lead to loss of diversity. And subsequent research has shown that successive courses of oral antibiotics impair the ability of those bacteria to recover and for the intestinal tract to recover that bacterial diversity. What's the relevance of microbiome disruption to human health? Well, first, we know that there is a colonization imperative because education of our immune system is critical and developmentally timed. Much of our understanding comes from experiments involving germ-free mice. These mice who are raised in sterile environments have a very abnormal phenotype in terms of their immune system, and they're very susceptible to inflammatory and allergic diseases as adults. Here's a schematic of what might be happening in those early days of immunologic and bacterial interactions within the GI tract. 
The topmost row represents the luminal contents of our colon with bacterial densities approaching 10 to the 12th bacteria per milliliter. Those luminal contents are separated by our 10 micron thick epithelial layer by a mucus layer, which is where the interaction happens. And then within the lamina propria of our bowel, we have naive immune cells, which are sent from the thymus and have actual homing receptors that specifically track them into the intestine, like kindergartners being shown where to go on their first day of class. These naive immune cells then are educated within the gut. Dendritic cells actually extend finger-like projections through the tight junctions between the epithelial cells to sample those bacterial in the mucus layer. They then return to lymphoid tissue within the gut to interact and communicate with those naive immune cells. And that communication is critical because it sends that, that immune cell on a pathway to regard those bacteria as friend rather than foe. This immune system education in our gut is developmentally timed. It has to happen early in life. Game is over if it doesn't happen early. And it's critical for the development of tolerance to our gut microbiota and to the environment as well. So we have a pathway that may explain how colonization disruptors lead to immune dysregulation. Disruption of the microbiome can lead to a poorly educated immune system, leading to decreased tolerance and a pro-inflammatory phenotype, which can increase risk for allergic and autoimmune diseases. What's the evidence that this is actually happening in humans? This is a study looking at over 250,000 children and the risk of developing asthma in childhood based on antibiotic exposure in the first 12 months of life. In the overall cohort, there is a 12% risk of asthma based on any antibiotic exposure. But in those children who had been exposed to four courses of antibiotics in the first year, that risk rose to 30%. This is a dose effect. The more antibiotic exposure, the higher risk, which fits with our understanding of the fact that successive courses of antibiotics Im impair the ability for recovery of the microbiome. It's not just allergic disease, also autoimmune diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease. A study published four years ago looked at the risk of developing IBD based on antibiotic exposure during childhood. That risk was highest with antibiotics that were taken before one year of age, conferring greater than five-fold risk of developing IBD later in life. The risk was attenuated somewhat the older the children got when they received that dose of antibiotics. This is an age effect. The infants are at highest risk because the immune system education is developmentally timed for that period. Disruption of the microbiome at that, in the earliest time points, has a more profound effect. There was also a dose effect in this population with that red curve representing more than two antibiotic courses during childhood and the risk of developing IBD. Again, for this particular disease outcome, a dose effect, more antibiotic exposures and higher risk. The second reason why there's a colonization imperative is because early life disruption of the microbiome may impart a metabolic phenotype that promotes obesity and insulin resistance. It turns out that one of the principal uh, jobs of our colonic microbiota are actually to take care of those non-digestible plant-based uh, carbohydrates that we can't handle. They ferment these in the bowel, produce short-chain fatty acids that we can then absorb and actually contribute to our caloric intake. And some bacteria are more efficient at that process than others. This is a seminal study from about 10 years ago that began to explore this relationship. This was a fecal transplantation experiment from humans into germ-free mice. They selected gut bacteria from obese and lean adults and transferred these into genetically similar germ-free mice and then fed those mice the exact same diet. What they found is that those mice with bacteria from obese human adults were more efficient at extracting calories from their food. The way they found this out is they actually studied the, the mouse poop itself and found that it was less calorically dense 
from those bacteria that were from obese adults, those bacteria were more efficient at extracting calories from food. And this resulted in a phenotype in those mice of increased adiposity. What's the evidence that this actually is occurring in humans? This is a study published just this year looking at the relationship between antibiotic prescriptions in the first two years of life and the outcome of obesity at age four in a cohort of over 21,000 British children. Here is their summary uh, adjusted results. This was robustly adjusted for familial obesity, mode of delivery, and socioeconomic status. In their cohort, there was a 24% increased risk of developing obesity with any antibiotic exposure at all early in life. When they stratified their analysis, they found that this effect was entirely driven by children who had been exposed to three or more courses of antibiotics early in life, and it was entirely driven by exposure to antibiotics that would impair or injure the anaerobic bacteria in the gut. This fits perfectly with our understanding of how, again, successive courses of antibiotics impair the ability, the resilience of the gut microbiota. So take home, take home points for you. First is that healthy bacterial colonization of the GI tract is important and critical for child health. Interestingly, the most important disruptors to colonization involve medical decision making, don't they? So decisions on mode of delivery by obstetricians and family medicine practitioners, but also on us as pediatric providers and decision making around use of antibiotics in infants and young children. And there is evidence to support the fact that disruption of bacterial colonization can cause lifelong alteration to immune system function that it makes a pro-inflammatory and less tolerogenic phenotype and can also negatively impact metabol metabolism in such a way of conferring an obesogenic phenotype. My hope for you today is that this may eventually change the conversation you have with families in your office. I think it's important for families to know that successive courses of oral antibiotics may increase the risk of allergic and autoimmune diseases in children. This changes the risk-benefit conversation around use of antibiotics. We have to recognize that the incidence of serious bacterial infection has declined dramatically over the last 100 years. In contrast, what we're seeing in our offices are allergic diseases and autoimmune diseases in greater numbers. We should also know that this is a cumulative effect. If you have a child in your office who was born by cesarean delivery, who was in the NICU and likely received antibiotics, we have to be extremely judicious about the use of oral antibiotics in that child because it's an additive risk to disruptions they've already sustained to their microbiome. And finally, I think as defenders of child health, one of the things we have to take in consideration is an important component of that is protecting and nurturing the bacteria that lie within. Thank you very much.